You're listening to Epic Footnote Productions. Go to Linktree slash Epic Footnote for links to all of our streaming platforms, YouTube channel, social media pages, and merch site. That's L-I-N-K-T-R dot E-E slash Epic Footnote. Hey everyone, what's going on? It's Am I Missing Something? It's Matt. It's Zach. If you have not joined us for one of these before, this is really our commentary platform show. We just have conversations about you know different topics that Zach and I kind of think up and really kind of ponder to ourselves are we missing something about this some people are going to think we're here to make fun of or to ridicule or you know no that's really not the case we're just here to have a conversation act a little stupid maybe but we're not here to ridicule or criticize anybody it's just more to find out through this conversation are we really missing something about a topic so today name a band right they've had a successful career and they say you know what it's time we're gonna ride off into the sunset and we're gonna go on tour come see us one last time we're saying farewell and you'll never see us again however and you might have heard this story a time or two a few times that you know what it's not the end we're coming back here's us back and better than ever before so that got us thinking am i missing something about when bands do farewell tours if that story sounds familiar too it's probably because that literally happened recently the almighty slayer as we've talked about how you know we, we examined their intense fan base and we even noted in that episode how like you know what good for them for the way that they're ending and you know ending on a high note sold out show at kia forum well out of nowhere uh this year in the year of 2024 six years maybe a little less no yeah about maybe less than six years slayer announced hey we're gonna reunite for a few festival shows what the hell happened to that two-year farewell final tour that you kept promoting and doing like what in the world and of course they're not the first or only band to have done that. In fact, oh, this no. year marks the 10th year anniversary when Motley Crue did a huge press conference. Yeah, announcing, this one, this one annoys this me before. the most. This mm-hmm. annoys me the most. They held a huge press conference saying, we are going to embark on our final tour. In fact, we are going to sign a contract right here, right now, stating that none of us can tour as Motley Crue without all four of us together. They signed it. They went on their merry way, did a two about a two-year-long farewell tour, only in 2019 to announce, we're back. We're blowing up that contract. We're back. We're going to go on a stadium tour of Def Leppard, which, of course, didn't happen until 2002 Dude. because of the pandemic. And then the following year, guess who's out of the band over mysterious, crazy reasons that we cover in, in depth in the past? Am I missing something episode? Wink, wink. Sorry, Mick Mars. Hope you're doing well of your new solo album. So there, that's a great example of literally being caught on tape lying through your teeth. And of course, Nikki Six looking like a jerk because he's went on a whole tangent like, yeah, we're not going to come back. We're going to stay true to our word. Yeah, no, you didn't. No. You literally got caught being a hypocrite. But it even goes back to artists that we love. I mean, also the 50th anniversary of David Bowie actually going on his farewell tour. I don't know if you even recall this, Matt, but in 1974, he embarked on a fi- what he was dubbing as the final tour, uh, even led to two shows in Madison Square Garden, only for, like I think, two years later. He was back, recording, touring, and he even flat out admitted, oh, yeah, I lied. I lied. I just wanted At to least he play admitted bigger. It. That's not much better. I don't know if that's actually much better, because yeah, you admitted it after you got the check. You know what? Them zeros speak. Well, and I think that leads to, so what are we missing? Well, Here's the sad truth. Money. Yes. Money. It's a, it's it's a double it's a double-sided cash grab. That's really what it is, right? You go away, you sell out all of the stadiums that you're going to cuz oh my god, this is the last time ever. And then come back a couple of years later, 5 years later, and we're back and better than ever. Oh my god, you're back. Here's some more money. You sell out again. But here's where I I scratch my head. I mean, is the amount of money that a band could make really worth the damage 
that they do to their credibility. And I get, well, okay, you just chuckle. I guess, yeah, if it really, if it, if the check clears, I guess so. But like, how as a fan in good faith can you still spend your money on an artist that literally flat out lies to you? I think there's one band that we can agree on that them doing it is kind of their MO, right? Kiss, for example. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, the sellouts of all sellouts, like anything, anything to make a buck. So not to say that, you know, it's right that Kiss did what, like 21 farewell tours? Eh, sounds about right. Similar. <laughs> so, yeah, I, I mean, it's not right that they did that many, but, you know, it's kind of it's kind of their thing. So, all right, whatever. Well, it's funny. But, you know, we were um, – because in December 2023, they played their quote-unquote last show. And I was like, Matt, should we, like, maybe do, like, some sort of episode dedicated to Kiss to, like, you know, celebrate their legacy? And he was like, they don't, I don't know. They're going to be back in a few years. Granted, they kind of seem to be done. But wouldn't you know it, as soon as they ended their final show, guess what they introduced? Avatar versions of Kiss. They live on. Yeah, no. Freaking joke. So that's Kiss's thing. But the Motley Crue thing. So that granted, I thought... you off more than Kiss? Yes. Because, I mean, at least Kiss lets you know that, you know, uh, we're going we're gonna to sell ourselves out. We're going to make cartoons and comic books and condoms and you name it, they put their name on it, right? So this is their thing to... It's just to make money. Okay, great. We know that. Motley Crue, however, this scenario annoys the hell out of me because you signed a legal document that says you're done and that's it. You can't come back. Well, first but then off, you, you think that was an actual legal document in hindsight? You think that was real? I don't know. Who knows? <laughs> What's real anymore? That's fair. This is just fantasy. Is Exactly. I'm calling a landslide and there's no escape from reality. Looking at that and the whole show that they put on with that, just to turn around, quote, blow up the contract and then announce a tour with Def Leppard. I thought Motley Crue was done years before that. And they come back and they don't sound any better. They don't sound more inspired. They're just Motley Crue. Okay. Well, what was the purpose of that? Nobody Money. tried, to, right? But nobody did solo projects in that time. Nobody really did anything in that time. Of note, right? I mean, Vince Neil did some solo shows, and I mean, that doesn't count. Vince Neil sounds like, he sounds like a dying pigeon. Even in Motley Crue, he sounds like a dying pigeon. But I don't understand. Other than the money thing, I don't understand why you would even say like okay we're going to do a legal document and then blow it up years later that is the most hypocritical thing that you can do kiss is okay because it's part of i don't know if it's part of the shtick but we know that they're going to just sell out or do whatever it takes to make money because if madison square garden comes to call in and they say hey here's a 50 million dollar check to come back and play a show here at madison square garden kiss is going to be all over that i guess i mean it's i don't know if i'm like ah oh, whatever just kiss i'm just not surprised with Kiss. I am surprised of Slayer. I really Slayer, do. right. Slayer's that was out of nowhere. Well, that was out of nowhere. And also the timing was weird because keep in mind, like, not only did like a few weeks, like not even a few weeks, like barely two or three weeks before suddenly Slayer goes, Yep, we're playing festivals. Carrie King finally, after years and years of teasing that he was gonna do he finally unleash his solo album announced he was his a release date for his solo album his first single the lineup to his band and he even trashed his former bandmates most namely tom Maria, saying you know like yeah like basically i never wanted to quit slayer but i found out in an interview tom didn't want to do it anymore and that led to talks and boom here we are i and i don't text with them anymore and but whatever I, I played all the bass on the 90s albums anyway like literally throwing tom under the bus Two, three weeks later, Slayer's back. I'm like, so what? Did that inspire Tom to be like, oh, I really do owe carry a text, huh? Let me text him and see how he's doing. Like, what ha how what happened between that Rolling Stone interview with Carrie King and the announcement of the Slayer tour? Like, did a did the Danny Wilmer festival promotions finally go, all right, how about this number? 
And they go, okay, yeah. $6,666,000. Yeah, let's do it. Boom. Like I, that, that to me, just like a band that for a band that had really it's an only its integrity. Granted, you can argue that towards the end, they were really getting kind of kissy kiss esque with the type of merchandise they were selling and all that. But like that band sh- had a little bit more integrity and to kind of throw it away to just suddenly do these festivals just for cash. I, it just doesn't feel right to me. Something just like it's just that that's disappointing out of everything. Yeah, there's it feels weird with Slayer doing it. Do you really get that bored in retirement? Or could you really Maybe. not like could you really not form another band and do something different? Well, you know what though? If you think about it, if you're in a big band, you get used to a certain lifestyle. And not just lifestyle at home or just with living, a lifestyle on the road. When you're in a big band, you get used to having dressing rooms, having a big stadium full of fans screaming your names. And there's definitely times when artists have even admitted like, yeah, when I did my solo project, I realized, oh, wow, no, okay. Not, fans are not as excited to see me play solo as they are to see me with this band. I actually think back, I mean, granted, Geezer Butler didn't really, wasn't the one that said it outright. I think it was really more Matt Sar who let it slip, but basically in the gist of it, shortly after Black Sabbath, Played their final tour, and let's be real, it's only a matter of time until Black Sabbath reforms. Geezer Butler formed a project with Matt Sorum of formerly of Guns N' Roses, Bell Revolver, and the Cult. Um, I'm blanking the guitarist's name, but he was in Billy Idol's band for a while. And Frankie Perez, uh, who was in Apocalyptica, Scars on Broadway with Darren from System of Down, and and was kind of almost the singer in Bell Revolver. Uh, before they finally put the final nail on that coffin and said, no, we shouldn't continue about Scott Wheelwood. They formed a band called Deadland Ritual, and they were hyping up that they you know, they were going to release a full album, play a lot of shows together. They only ended up releasing a few singles and playing some small shows and some festival dates. There's a few different reasons for why you know apparently it didn't work out. Uh, Steve Stevens, the guitarist who was in Billy Idol's band, you know, Matt was like, well, you know, he was having some health issues, but he also kind of let it slip. It's like, yeah, and some of the band members, they were just not really used to the kind of gigs from starting from the bottom, essentially. And that, you know, because it wasn't like just they were able to go straight into arenas and play huge stuff. They were playing clubs that they probably had to walk from the back of the room to the stage to get to it. There is no backstage even, let alone a dressing room. So when you're a big artist coming from a big band, you kind of, you know, and you realize, wait, I have to start from scratch again i have to tour in a van I, get, I can't get a bus anymore well how do i get back on a bus oh i can only do that with my old band all right well that's where the paycheck goes i mean like i think in the end of the day like it's not as easy as just like oh i want to form a new band ego gets in the way in that regards like forget even money per, per se just ego but if you wanted to still live that lifestyle why did you guys decide to call it quits well Probably one of two reasons. They hate each other and said, not worth it anymore. Let's make one big last paycheck and say goodbye. Or they just like, you know what? I'm getting old. Let's say goodbye. And then they, they, they change it. Or maybe it's like, hey, I don't like you. I need at least a long break. But the management's going, you know what? Instead of saying this is a hiatus, call it a farewell tour. That way we can make money off of it being called a farewell tour and making fans think it's the last time. And then boom, when you decide, you know what, fine, I like you enough where I don't need to talk to you after the show every night, but I can stand you for two and a half hours on stage. Let's do another tour. Then we'll call it a reunion tour. So maybe that's even it. That's just strategic. It's like the management company goes, all right, we know you guys hate each other and you want to take at least three, five year break. Let's call it a breakup officially, get some money out of it, and then we'll make even more money when you come back with that new album. Because if you think about it, like the bands that just go on hiatus, their return is never as big as a band that's reuniting. Very few bands really come back on a strong note after a hiatus, as opposed to a, we broke up and now we're back. See, then at that point, 
credibility is out the window. Absolutely. All, there's, there, there's no credibility to anything anymore when it comes to farewell tours or, the, you know, this is it. it. It's all a marketing gimmick. Absolutely. And that's what's so frustrating. It's like, why do us fans still give into it? Why do we, why are we paying that extra money to see them for the last time when really in the back of our heads we go, is it though? Is this really the last time that we're going to see them? Is it though? Like, why, like at that, at that point, it's really our fault as fans for, for inspire, for in, encouraging them to do this shit. I don't think anybody encourages it. I think it's just, we are by buying tickets. Well, okay. To be fair, you're always going to want to go see like your favorite band. And if this is possibly quote unquote, the last time, of course, you're going to want to say you were there. But outside of that, I, um, I wouldn't necessarily go see the reunion show. Like I would, I would give them the money once, right? I'd give them the benefit of the doubt on the goodbye show, and then the comeback show. Mm, no, you got to earn my trust again because you said you were never coming back. I will say I've definitely paid for seeing a farewell show. I've paid for reunion shows, but not because uh, oh they. The only time I've gone to a re- quote unquote reunion show is when the band suddenly broke up, when you weren't given a chance to see them say goodbye. Because I mean, that's when it's like, oh no, I'm not going to miss my chance this time to say, to see them. Whereas like farewell tour is like, no, that's it. And then to your point, it's like, well, no, you've said farewell tour. So I'm not going to rush to go see you. But like, for instance, I made an effort, even though I've seen black Sabbath a few times, I made an effort and even paid the Madison square garden price. Cause we all know miraculously somehow Seeing a show at Madison Square Garden is always 10 times more expensive than any other arena in America. But I paid top money to see Black Sabbath in Madison Square Garden one more time with the knowledge of it being the last time I'd see Black Sabbath in Madison Square Garden. And I'll admit, I'll be a little bummed out that even if they, and even actually what I was like, listen, even if they do come back, the chances of them coming back to Madison Square Garden seem slim. So I'll be bummed if they end up playing doing a reunion tour that includes Madison Square Garden because I paid money to see their final show at Madison Square Garden. But would I rush to see them reunite? Yeah, that's another. I don't know. Wouldn't rush. People to it. paid lots to see lots of farewell shows for Kiss. You know, I, it's funny because I feel like Madison Square Garden was the perfect place for Kiss to end, and definitely it seemed like there was a good chunk of tickets sold for both of those shows but i do wonder how much how well the actual farewell tour did and other markets because even some diehard fans are like yeah sure i'm sure that this is the last time like maybe they were like oh maybe paul and gene will be playing their final show but like in the back of our heads we were waiting for kiss to announce a new version of kiss with other people in makeup we weren't expecting them to announce the avatars that will be coming out and the uh, side note i find this whole like avatar version of kiss hysterical because if you look at like what they're teasing mind you they could have chosen any era of kiss to create a digital version of but they went with the current version of kiss because that's what i want to freaking pay 40 plus dollars to see on a screen uh go hire 70 year old gene simmons not gene simmons in his prime come on yeah because they had to get the people probably who were under contract to go into the booth and record all that stuff or however it's done i'm sorry but pay ace freely and peter chris an extra few dollars for the likeliness yeah come on yeah because we're bitter old men and we're gonna yell at clouds we will, but still, it's just but to me. I'm just like, come on, guys, stop fooling yourselves here. Stop making it. Ma- stop acting like this current version of Kiss is the one that millions and millions of fans want to see. They do. No, they don't. They're clearly paying for it. Ba- no one's paying for it yet. And also, uh, literally, the res- the the response to it, even from f- diehard fans who were in the arena that night, 
that their rea- most of the reactions was really no 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 i mean like the kiss on tour like they pay oh, people no, are you, still paying to see people are still kiss. paying it but they we, they went from stadiums to arenas Math, I, that's what i'm saying i don't necessarily know how many how many tickets they were really selling like, there's still a good chunk of people don't get me wrong but the appeal of kiss definitely has died over the years mainly because the whole they'll do anything for a buck has gotten old and that goes yes. back to credibility like that people don't have money now. well that too but it's just gotten hard for like people to like justify simmons's actions and to justify a band that is constantly coming back and constantly also frankly ignoring their history and i say that with love too i love kiss i've seen kiss it's just the more and more you tour the more and more you just go back on your word it devalues the brand i at least i would think right like the amount of times like the years you spend saying like i look at the eagles right now they are on their long goodbye tour that is literally going to last two plus years maybe even three at this point hey at least they said it yeah they well exactly they at least meant like yeah we get it haha this is funny um but like even that it's like well didn't you already announce it like fair like it's just like at what point do you just go you know what enough just say goodbye already and let me be thankful that i saw you at least once in my life like how many new fans are you really going to encourage to come out of the woodworks to see you live well I would ask with a that, farewell, or I should say, reunion tour, would, different story. I would ask that question of Motley Crue more than any oh. of these other bands. Like, I'm sorry, if they sounded good, right? Then I would kind of understand. Like seeing John Five, okay, that may be a treat, but even the videos I've seen of that have been very iffy at best. Right, but like they're talking about doing new music. That's like. That's cringe. That's not going to be good. Which is hysterical because they keep saying, again, not to go too in deep with the Am I Missing Something episode where we talk about their lawsuit with Mick Mars. Like Mick Mars going like, well, I've said like, if, you know, I can join them for one-off shows or for like new music. And the manager's like, but there's no new music. They're just a touring band. Right. And why is Nikki Six posting photos of them in the studio on social media? Like, uh, come on, guys. You're not helping your lawyers here. But I'll say this, I've said it before in past episodes, and I've said it again in regards to Motley Crue. Motley Crue is a band that PR built. They had some good songs. We talked about Shot of the Devil, how that was, you know, an album that we forgot how much we liked until we revisited it. Um, They had some good singles, but really, in the end of the day, behind the music and the Dirt autobiography made that band the icon that they are that I joked about how, you know, for everyone who goes Molly Crew should be in the rock and hall of fame. No, no, their publicists should that the publicity that they've created for themselves is what really helped make them a star. And that's what's really helped get them into their arenas and stadiums, not the music. I'm sorry, not the music, not the musicianship. It's the fucking story. If there's one band that I can't take seriously anymore, it's them. Did you ever take them seriously? Yeah, at one point, like I kind of stood by the Saints of Los Angeles for a while. Did you? But, yeah. Oh, wow. When it first came out. But outside of that, all of this nonsense with uh, Mick Mars and the, the farewell tour and the reunion and guys, do you like not watch videos of yourself? Do you not hear yourself? Do you not see that? This is a giant mess that's being held together by spit and duct tape. Sometimes spit and duct tape is enough to trick fans who are dying for nostalgia into thinking they are getting what they remember fondly as a kid. Sometimes. I mean, feeding the ducks at a pond is great from time to time, but. Yeah. Uh, So. You got to do something else. So let me ask you a question two-part question and granted i don't even know how i'd answer this is there a band let's say there's a band that says all right we are announcing our farewell tour this is our this quote unquote is our final tour and the last chance you'll get to see us play live in your city which band would you pay 
a good chunk of money to go see for their final tour. And then which band, whether or not they actually did a farewell tour or even just finally are reuniting that you would be like, I have to see them reunite. The second that they announce a reunion show, I will see them regardless of farewell tour or not. So the first one is Metallica. Just to say that I was there, because I said that earlier, right? Like, there's always going to be that one band that you just want to say that you were there for, and I, that'd be Metallica. And there are two bands right off the top of my head that if they did a reunion show, like if they went away hypothetically and then said, you know, we're coming back, the two bands would be Newfound Glory or Breaking Benjamin, because I've seen neither of them. And I know me. Hold on, they're still together, though. I know, but I'm saying hypothetically if they broke up oh, and came back. I'm, oh, okay. That's not what I was asking, but that's fair. So, okay, so if a still band... Fair. No, 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 still, well, still fair. I mean, that's still good answers, and that's still good to know, that you would, if they did break up and came back, you would still be loyal and, and say, cool, I'm going to go see you reunite. Right, because cause I've never seen them before. That's the whole thing. You've never thing. seen Newfound Glory? No. I know what we're doing this summer. Yep. Hi, Cyrus. Uh, so the band and, you know, I know they came back already and I miss them. And I don't know if this counts in your mind, but Queen with Adam Lambert. I guess that kind of counts. Sorry, I'm not giving you the juicy part that you want, but. <laughs> no, 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 that's fair. Well, and honestly, I don't blame you for. I wouldn't say that that's not juicy, but. So. I will say this first. The band that would, if they announced a farewell tour, I'd be going in a heartbeat. Yes, I agree. Metallica. I've seen them live so many times, but that is such an important band in my life that I do. That's the one band I actually do feel the urge to be like, no, I need to say goodbye. Although I feel like if, uh, when we saw them in August, if that was actually the last tour, I'd be like, that's okay. I'm good. But I would feel the urge to see them one last time. And I would actually, probably unlikely because they are definitely getting up there, but I would kind of hope that that it's much further down the road that my son and daughter would be old enough that I could take them to it without their little tiny eardrums being blown apart. So that would actually even be more incentive. It's like my kids were of age where they could <laughs> comfortably go to a concert without me freaking out. Take them to Metallica one last time or <laughs> one time in my life, actually. Actually, and you know what? Foo Fighters. That's another band. If they announced a fair, I don't want to say that out loud. Um, oof, I hate that notion that they might ever say goodbye. Um, but if they were to announce a farewell tour, I would be inclined to say, yeah, I need to see them one last time. But in regards to a band that like, who I would really want to see reunite, I think that's the other problem too, is that you name the band, they've probably reunited already. <laughs> like, and it's just the idea of even seeing them has kind of just gone like, meh. You know what I mean? Like, it's just, and that's why I picked two bands I've never seen. <laughs> no, and that, that's why I was I wasn't like, oh, that's like that's not what I mean. Like, that's like, oh, that's interesting way to take it. I, that's not my question, but that's fair answer and interesting too. Um, yeah, like that's the thing like and you know that also kind of leads me to um one of my favorite websites metal sucks.net they you know shortly after slayer they asked the readers like hey let's talk about you know share us your thoughts on reunions in general and they posed a few poll questions and i, I kind of want to re read some of the results first like do you like when a band reunites and uh, almost 50 percent said eh it's okay and slightly less than 30% were like, no, I love it. And then the rest were like, no, it sucks. So even like half of their readers were like, eh. And then you go like further down where it's like, all right, should a band ever, re we've talked about like reunions without key original members in it in a past seven episode. Like should a band ever reunite without its original member? Pretty much what we kind of discussed in that past seven missing something episode. It depends. 62% almost 63 actually percent said it depends. And then yes and no, are actually kind of almost even. And then uh, the question, do you plan to see a reunited band perform in 2024? This I actually found the most interesting. 
48% said no. Well, only 32% said yes, where 18 was like, if they're part of a festival, sure. And I found that fascinating because I feel like one of the th reasons why, one of the uh, arguments that a lot of say, people say like, well, yeah, of course these bands are reuniting because these festivals, they need draws. And the only big draw that people can get now is reunions. And if you look at this year, especially, I mean, you got Slayer on these metal festivals. You even got No Doubt reuniting for Coachella. And you've also got Sublime Ugh. reuniting with the son of Bradley Noel. I, I actually wanted, I wanted uh, Matt and I to have a discussion about how weird it is that there's actually currently two versions of Sublime touring this year. One with the original two members with Bradley's son filling in for him, and they're calling themselves Sublime. And then, then there's Sublime with Rome. Now, initially it was Eric Wilson and Rome Ramirez, but then when they announced, and they're building this Sublime of Rome's final tour, and uh, farewell, <laughs> ironically, their farewell tour. But what makes this even weirder is that Sublime of Rome is touring without any actual members of Sublime. So is it just Rome? It's doing... just Rome with other guys. Well, okay. So hold, hold on, hold on. This is where we have to draw the line here. Is it Sublime with Rome doing Sublime with Rome songs only? Nope. Or are they doing the original Sublime songs with yep. Sublime with Rome songs? Yep. That's weird. And in their defense, because Rome actually spoke of Rolling Center, he's like, yeah, I don't like this either. But the truth is, we had touring commitments already planned before Sublime with Bradley was even an idea, apparently. And we have contractual agreements. I would love to just go out as Rome, but that's not how we signed it. And he claims that, yeah, in fact, I didn't find out that Eric was not going to be joining us on tour until he posted on Instagram two weeks ago, hey, I'm no longer in Sublime with Rome. I'm just in Sublime. So that whole thing is just a crap show i mean good on him for trying to make it work i i feel for the guy to a certain degree but at the same time it's like this is just like who is uh, it's just weird to have two versions of sublime but again it goes to the appeal of farewell tours and reunions um and it's no coincidence that the sublime reunion is really all happening on the festival circuit it's almost like well, it's not a sublime reunion, technically. Uh, kind of is. I mean, well, they were no, well, they a, were a always the, together. Well, actually, no. The drummer has uh, left Sublime of Rome pretty early on in Sublime of Rome's lifespan. Like he shortly, like they initially. So when Bradley died, they disbanded. They kind of mm -hmm. played in some bands together, but they disbanded as Sublime, and then they initially wanted to come back as just Sublime with, you know, with Rome coming in the singer. But the Bradley Noel estate was like, nope, you do not have her permissions to just use Sublime and use Bradley's songs in that manner as Sublime without him. So they build themselves as Sublime with Rome. And for, I, I don't know how many years, but not that long uh, into Sublime with Rome's existence, the drummer was like, yeah, this doesn't feel right. Never mind. Bye. And they've been playing with Phil. Actually, Josh Fries at one point, I think for at least a year, was playing in Sublime with Rome um before he went on to some other bands too um so really it's just been eric wilson in rome and a rotating list of drummers and turntable lists and other musicians so that also you can raise a lot of questions as the supply of rome's existence in general but Nothing is, the drum, rome. is the original drummer for sublime, He's in sublime. Coming? yes okay so the original so the uh, version of sublime that's that's, that's like, playing Coachella yeah, and other festivals. It's the original two members plus Bradley's son. That's nitpicky. That's not a nitpicky. real. That's, that's a reunion. Um, nah. they're, play, they're playing with the spawn of Bradley. Okay. Who also. Uh, anyway. So if. Okay. So here, let's let's take it down this hypothetical road. If Dave Grohl, oh, oh, hold on, hold on. If Dave yeah. Grohl, Pat Smear, and Chris Novoselic got together and they put 
Kurt Cobain's daughter as the front woman, would you be okay with calling it Nirvana? No. It's not a day. Is that a reunion? It is a reunion. But you're not calling it Nirvana. If you don't call it Nirvana, then cool. That's fun. But if you're going to call it Nirvana, then that's weird and it's a reunion and without Kurt. It's kind of weird. Yeah, that's why I'm saying it's weird. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm, I agree. It's weird that they're, do, what they're doing with Sublime, but it's still a reunion. Mm. It's still a reunion. But anyway, and they're, but they're also calling it Sublime. It's, anyway, my point being, though, is that these festivals have so much expenses and they have so like it's almost like kind of what people were predicting with when shows and touring came back after the pandemic is kind of coming true in that you're hitting a bubble in that people went to so many shows and now they're getting kind of tired and also not as rich to be able to afford some of these concerts. And it's also getting even more expensive to put on said shows. Yeah, that's a big problem. Like it honestly, I don't envy people who are in the in the live music business. Like you have slim pickings in, in regards to what bands are even available to now play your festival because there's a million festivals all over the country competing for lineups. And it's just more expensive to put it on. So yeah, you kind of need that big name draw. And it, you know, Coachella is the one that kind of perfected the hey, we got this big band reuniting. We got L C D sound system and Guns N' Roses reuniting for Coachella. Come check it out. And it's just like they almost set the presence of, well, now we need some big surprise reunion to headline our festival to draw numbers in. But then even that sounds like if you're reading into these poll numbers, like even that's not as much of a draw anymore. Or if it is, it's like, okay, maybe I'll check it out if it's part of a festival of other of my favorite bands. Like it's just, it's a catch 22 in, uh, instance right now. I think that's the story of everything, though, right now, really. Like, you're damned if you do and you're damned if you don't, right? Like, because you need to raise prices to pay, you know, wages to keep up with everything. But that means you're making everything more expensive and the people yeah. who need to buy it can't afford to buy it. So it's, you know, it's a, just a big cycle. It's just a sign of the times, unfortunately. I, ha yeah. I hate I hate that, you know, I, I made a musical pun at that expense, but it is. It really is. It's just a sign of the times and I don't know what has to happen. I am no economist by any stretch of the imagination. So I just thought about this, like this is a chance for local music to make a bigger comeback. Well, I was actually going to say, I actually feel like these reunion shows and the farewell shows are kind of screwing over the newer bands, maybe even local bands. Cause if you think about it, and actually, one of the commenters in that Metal Sucks poll made a great point. These bands reuniting out of the blue just for a paycheck is kind of screwing over the band that needs that headlining slot to justify them as the next big yeah. thing. We talked about um, in our past Never Miss Thinking Something episode about where's the next Metallica? You know, where's the next big, like, you know, will there ever be a rock band as big and gigantic as Metallica? And part of the problem is, and I mentioned this in that episode, in that uh, bands, you want, you know, managers want their bands to play bigger and bigger venues, but you know, it's getting harder and harder to get newer or even like more just recent bands to play arenas or eat these big venues because the music acts from the 70s even are still around. They are doing long extended farewell tours and then suddenly coming back for these reunion tours. And they're taking up the space on the calendar at these arenas that would have otherwise gone to the newer acts. Because these arenas also have sports. They have family events during the day and night. Like, it's getting harder to actually book bands into these bigger spaces. Not even just because they're not as popular. Like they need both the big spaces to become popular, but they also need to have the big number. It's just like, I feel bad for these newer artists who can't become that, get to that next level. They're getting kind of shut out from that top billing spot. Like it, and then they get screwed because then when Metallica does finally die and, and aren't able to tour, they'll never be able to sell out Madison Square Garden because they never even got a chance to play the second next level stadium. Crazy times. There's got to be some sort of bubble to this. Like there's going to be a band 
that is going to just push this too far at one point. I don't know who it is. When you say push it too far, as in, like they're going to do some, they're going to do some out, do a farewell outrage. score and then come back. Right, they're going to say like, okay, we're going to go away, we're going to come back like six months later, and everybody's going to be like, no, fuck you, we just paid to see you six months ago. I'm not going to come see you again, and I think that's going to start the downward trend of these farewell reunion cycles. And you know, some there, there's got to be something because there's always a bubble to everything, right? I don't know if there's going to be a bubble for this one. I feel I don't know because I also don't know if there's a band big enough to like cause such an outrage. I honestly thought Slayer would have been that band to have caused the outrage, but I think it's been more tepid, like, eh fine like disappointment sure but like no one's even a few people are like yes they're back the metal gods are back i'm like they were barely gone but it has to be somebody that people really care about I, like if, fan, like we talked about I, how much slayer fans care i'm just saying right we, but, we talk about bigger bands and right but slayer can do no wrong in their eyes like slayer can put out a total crap album and they'll still eat it up. But or the uh, the ones who know that Slayer can do wrong just don't care enough to right. whine about it. So maybe it's and I hate to say this, but if the Foo Fighters ever did something like that, like if Dave Grohl said, "No, I'm done. We're done. That's it. See you later," and then they do the farewell tour six months later. Hey, we're back. Um, what? See, I feel like I feel like Dave Girl would just charm our pants off, <laughs> and we'd be like, "Ah, oh, we missed you, Dave." Okay, like I don't know if even that like would be enough to piss people off into never going back to a union tour. I think in the end of the day, we're our own worst enemy, and we end up actually. Could it be Guns N' Roses? No, because I think enough... I think they are over... I think at this point... they. I think enough people are like, uh, Axles doesn't sound that great anyway, that they'd welcome me, like, all right, goodbye. And then if they came back, it's like, eh, whatever. If they did that right after the, listen, we're back for Slash, but we're only doing this for one tour, so you better catch this now. And then two years later going, ah, Slash liked it. We're gonna ha- He's going to stay in the band even longer. That would cause outrage, I think. But now at this point, you could even make the argument. And we talked about this in another past that I mean, missing something episode of how like it's like they've been a, they've been doing this now for a few years and, it's, and without really any new music other than the random sporadic single slash Chinese democracy leftovers. That like I, I almost feel like again it would cause a eh, reaction if there wasn't already outrage by the fact that the who announced in 1982 that they were doing a farewell tour only five years later to come back and continue touring. If that wasn't enough to make people go, screw this farewell concept, I don't know what else would. Even the Grateful Dead, who who built their brand on authenticity and, you know, fans first mentality, for them to literally do five farewell shows with Trey Anastasio on guitar, only for a year later to to create Dead and Company, which really is just the Grateful Dead minus Phil Lesh and John Mayer on guitar, and then to do it. Granted, the tour, you know, they did many successful tours, and then to announce a farewell tour last summer, only to announce a Las Vegas residency at the Sphere, because granted, they found the catch hole. We never, we, you know, we never said we'd be ceasing to exist. Just stop touring. For the well, Grateful that was, Dead, that's Ozzy's mo. Oh, it is Ozzy's mo, and but uh, we've got we've grown used to that too. Like for Dead and Company and the Grateful Dead to almost get a pass from their Deadheads for all these fake. We're saying farewell. 
JK, we're coming back as this our incarnation, but we all know it's the same thing. Wink, wink. Like, if that's not enough to break the bubble of, we're not going to take this reunion and farewell crap, what freaking will? Well, wait a second. When is that residency happening? May. Maybe that could be it. Because think no, about it, right? It's, it's, well, well, no, no, no. Like, have they announced how it's selling? All reports indicate that a lot of the general admission tickets are sold out. There's still some VIP packages available for Dead and Company at the Sphere, but it seems to be selling well enough for them to not be canceling anything. And that's again, fa- the f- that's fairly surprising. I mean, again, clearly Deadheads are just happy to see half of the lineup on stage. They're, they're just a happy group of people. Well, they are. So I feel like there's got to be at some point a bubble that pops that breaks this trend or there's got to be a new way of marketing because I feel like that's like the, the marketing thing to do for these older bands. Like there's got to be a new marketing thing that somebody comes out with. Well, I mean, what could be, I don't know. Cause that's, I'm not, not smart really, enough to think of it. I'm not, well, I'm just I mean, saying, no, but like, that's a fair point though. I mean, if you think about it, really, that's all touring is all that these hair, like, let's be honest, heritage and legacy acts have. I mean, no one's music sales for everyone is declining. So clearly these older artists are not going to sell as many copies as they used to. And frankly, these older bands always used to work off the model of we only record albums to sell stuff on tour to give us an excuse to tour. It's just an extra piece of merch to sell at the booths anyway. So really like what, you know, you know what? This leads to another question, a little sidetrack here. Which gimmick are you more tired of? And I think I kind of know the answer of this, but are you more tired of the farewell slash reunion tour gimmick? Or the we're playing this album in its entirety gimmick. No, it's the farewell tour. I'm getting a little t- fed up with the album once. Really? I'm not saying I'm I'm more so than farewell and reunion tours, but like it's almost like to your point, like what other market things like that one's being like kind of put like I feel like there's so many tours this year that are watch Green Day perform both Dookie and American Idiot in its entirety. Which I just joked about in the past episode, how I'm like, oof, if you just said American Idiot, I might have been on board. But two albums in its entirety plus three openers? No, thank you. That's too much for me. That's too long of a night. Uh, see, I, I disagree with that. Like, I remember I went to go see Opeth when they played um, Ghost Reveries in its entirety. And I loved the hell out of that show because it's my favorite album from them. So... Why wouldn't I want to see the entire album live? So going, you know, going to see them do the album and then do other songs, it's it was a good night. I would love that. Like if there's a band that you like that does that, great. It's gonna be a good time. If you're like eh on the band, like you're so so like Weezer just announced that they're gonna be doing the blue album in its entirety. I'm, I'm okay with that. I would bypass that. Because I'm not, I like so the idea, but I'm not paying massive square garden prices for that show, right? But that's the point, though. It's like yeah. if you're gonna go see it, you're gonna go see it because you like the band. It's almost like these are the true fans that are gonna go see Weezer, these are the so, true fans. That are you are you implying go see that Day. farewell tours and reunion? Well, I, I would actually definitely agree that with reunion tours, a lot of it is uh, there's a good half of the audience is just fans who are like, oh, I like this band. and now I get to say I was part of the cool reunion tour that was all about that people were all buzzing about. Do you think that's similar to farewell tours? That it's literally just people going like, ah, I like the band, and I heard this is the last time, so I might as well make a special. I hear it's going to be a special event. Yeah, it's people who want to be a part of the experience to say that I was there for their last time, or I was there when they came back. That's really it. Um, you know, it's it's not like the true fans show, and I don't think that that's the intention of. Well, actually, it might be the intention of the farewell show to just be the biggest cash grab possible for the band for five years and then come back. Maybe you know what, that's, that's, maybe that's, that's the reason why they do it. That's an interesting way to look at it, too, is that there is, if you think about it, two types of farewell tours. There's one, or at least there's two types of ways to really say goodbye. There's the authentic, like, no, we're just, these are our two final shows, and this is really like, 
for our diehard fans. Like, if you love this all these years, like we're really making sure that you get to see this one last time. And then there's the, all right, big arenas, as many fans as we can pack in for one last time. Doesn't like I almost think of like the Ramones when how they did the their farewell tour. Uh, and it really, from what, you know, it felt like all, by all accounts, like people coming out of the word works to say goodbye to their favorite band, the Ramones, whereas like Kiss, or maybe Kiss to a certain degree too, but even like, I'm sure Elton John, there was a ton of people at Dodger Stadium's his final US show that were just there to say, yeah, I was there for Elton John's last show. And you can get away with that yep. because it's such a massive arena. It's going to feel inauthentic to a certain degree. But once again, if this is just the cash grab, who cares about authenticity anymore? It's yeah. it's about putting money in our pockets so we can ride off into the sunset for a few years, take some vacations, quote, live a normal person life, and then come back in five years, seven years, and you know get that other big paycheck because the money's running out from five to seven years ago. As I said earlier in this episode, money, it's a gas. Well, what do you think? I told Fellow you listeners. Think. Well, I know oh. what you're thinking. Now I'm asking those who are listening to us blabber on and on and on about farewells or some reunions. Are we way off? Are you all for paying a ton of money to see your band say goodbye only to then have to pay another ton of money to see them reunite a few years later? Are we missing something? Are we forgetting something important about how this is all a scam and that we're all just puppets in the Illuminati's world, aka Ticketmaster and Live Nation? Lizard people, tinfoil hats, they're all out there. Exactly. Let us know on Facebook, Instagram, threads, if that's still a thing by the time you listen to this. X, formerly known as Twitter, if they haven't gone back to Twitter. TikTok. Yeah, we're still on TikTok. Also, subscribe to our YouTube channel to listen to more episodes like this. And thank you, thank you, thank you to Lucky 13 Beard Cup. If you haven't tried a beard bomb or oil, but you've always been curious about it, men's grooming products, they've got them too. Lucky 13, the number Beard Co., Dot com is where you're going to want to go. The finest beard bombs and oils on the internet. And we've collaborated with them to bring you the Lemmy. It is a beard oil that we were inspired by Lemmy from Motorhead on. Bourbon, tobacco, cola, leather. It smells fantastic. It's going to make you feel amazing. And we're going to make your wallet feel amazing because we're going to give you 10% off of your entire order by using the code EFP10 at checkout. So throw anything in your cart that you want, including the Lemmy EFP10, 10% off, Lucky13, the number beardco.com. If you want to support us so we can keep doing episodes like this, or even just to let your friends know, hey, I like to listen to the music podcast. Go to the link in our bio on any of our social media pages, linktree slash epic footnote, where you can find cool merch like our t-shirts, hoodies, hats, coffee mugs, stickers. We're not saying farewell, so we need these t-shirt sales to keep us through for many more years. Appreciate it if you buy one and if you let your friend, again, just so you can show off how cool our logo looks and how you like to listen to podcasts. We thank you in advance for that. And thank you once again for listening to this episode. We hope you join us for another episode real, real soon. Farewell.